Good morning. Um, I just wanted to start off, uh, if you're looking at my um, bio in the uh, pamphlet, there's a um, mistake on my credentials. It should be LLB. I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm not sure where the D came in, but that's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not trying to pretend anything that I'm not, so I just wanted to say that right off the bat. Um, I am an SFU graduate. I went to SFU, um, I graduated in 2006 uh, through criminology. I, and it's interesting looking back, I remember writing a paper on um, persons with dementia and, um, and their involvement in the, in the criminal justice system. And um, so it's interesting that I'm back at SFU and, just, and uh, part of this conference today. Um, I'm a new lawyer, I'm a new call, I'm new to immigration law, and I'm interested in social justice work. So um, I became involved with the West Coast Domestic Workers Association. Uh, this association is a nonprofit, and uh, we provide education and legal assistance to live-in caregivers in British Columbia. And um, just touching on um, some of the remarks that were made, Basically, uh, our clients are um, uh, foreign workers who come to Canada and are grappling with the issues that were discussed this morning, working as a community health worker on top of having temporary resident status in Canada um, and struggling with immigration issues um, while trying to do the work that they do every day. So. Um, it's an interesting dynamic. So <clears throat> I just wanted to give some uh, background to the West Coast Domestic Workers Association. So uh, it was started over 25 years ago by two law students. And uh, right now, we continue to operate a drop-in clinic. We see more than 200 clients per month. And all of our clients, as I mentioned, are foreign nationals and they enter Canada through the Living Caregiver Program, which I'm gonna discuss uh, in a few moments. Uh, approximately 98% of our clients are women. Most of these women are coming from developing countries um, so, uh, such as the Philippines, that's <clears throat> most, sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Most of the clients are from the Philippines um, but we also have other clients who are from Indonesia. Um, we've got clients from Mexico, China, the Sudan. Um, and the clients, many of them are university educated. Um, they're nurses in their own countries. Um, they're teachers. And they need to, they feel they need to underemploy themselves in order to have the, an opportunity to immigrate to Canada. So, um, what is the Living Caregiver Program? If some of you are unfamiliar, it's an immigration stream uh, that was brought in in 1992. And um, it offers uh, uh, persons from other countries a chance to um, fast track their means to permanent residence by performing living caregiving uh, duties in Canada. And uh, presently, more than 8,000 caregivers are admitted to Canada each year. And 4,000 of those, so more, actually more than 4,000 of those um, are working in British Columbia. When a, when a caregiver arrives into Canada, she's, and I'm gonna say she because most of them are women, um, they're issued a work permit. And the work permit is highly restrictive. The work permit says that the um, caregiver can only work for one employer, the person who's named on the work permit. If they do any other work for any other person, um, it's considered unauthorized work. Um, they, they must live with their employer. So um, this presents also uh, other challenges in the sense that if the caregiver loses her job, she becomes not only unemployed, but she also becomes homeless. Um, caregivers are able to work for, um, to provide care for elderly persons, 
um, or uh, child or provide ca uh, child care or um, work for those with special needs and disabled persons. Um, and they're on a strict timeline. The government gives living caregivers four years to do 24 months of authorized work in Canada in order to be eligible to apply for permanent residence. So if you can imagine, if um, <clears throat> issues arise where um, a caregiver is working for someone and they pass away, or it doesn't work out with that employer and they need to find a new employer, they have to do it very quickly because they're on the four-year timeline and they need to get that next job quickly. Um, <clears throat> so just to step back, I just wanted to provide a, just a brief historical overview of where the roots of the living caregiver come from. Um, so it started uh, back in the 1900s and uh, that was when um, there was a program that was created for uh, Eastern European, mostly women, to come over and do domestic labor. This morphed into, into the 1950s, an agreement with uh, Jamaica and Barbados uh, to bring in uh, Caribbean women to look after Canadian families. And then in 1981, there was a domestic movement, um, which was the impetus for the living caregiver program that we have today. So I just wanted to provide that. So I have prepared this uh, PowerPoint, but I'm not sure how closely I'm gonna stick to it in the interest of time. And I'd like to be able to take questions as well when, when we sit back down. So I um, just wanted to talk about briefly about what it's like to work in the living caregiver program. So was it, as I alluded to, um, there's uh, several issues that are going on. There's the, um, the immigration um, aspect where the, the living caregiver is under these strict timelines. Many caregivers have reported to us that they feel um, compelled to stay in an exploitive working environment because they always are looking for their chance to apply for permanent residence. And so they will put up with things that other people would not put up with um, because they feel they can't afford to quit their job. Um, many of these issues are, um, are related to the live-in requirement, which I'm gonna discuss in a moment. Um, the, I mean, you can imagine having to live with your boss um, 24-7. And we kind of talked about, um, you know, un uh, 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 just unrealistic expectations. And when the caregiver's in the home and afraid of losing her job, because if she refuses to do the work, she's worried that they'll fire her. Um, yeah, okay, I'll get up at 3 in the morning. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, okay. You know, you're you're there. You're the only one that's there, and it it, it is a very isolating experience um, that's reported to us. So, um, then just to touch upon some uh, unique uh, experiences for living caregivers who are dealing with elderly persons. Um, most of the caregivers that I come across are working or providing childcare but um, I haven't been with the organization that long, but I have spoken to some of my colleagues, and these are the main issues that, that were identified. Um, there's a c complication that arises when determining who's going to be the employer for the living caregiver. Is it going to be the person who's receiving the care, who's in many cases, you know, an an adult who is quite capable of managing their finances to some degree and, and, and they feel they should be the employer? Or is it going to be the son or daughter or another family member of the person? And um, it becomes an issue because 
<laughs> when the living, the, the living caregiver program is very employer driven in the sense that employers are the ones who need to, uh, it, it, it's all dependent on getting this labor market opinion. The labor market opinion says that you can get a work permit. The employer has to apply for the labor market opinion. The, um, the employer has to provide a record of employment to allow the caregiver to report that she's done the 24 months so that she can get permanent residence. The employer has to properly compensate the employee. The employer has to file taxes, do all these things. And sometimes it's difficult for living caregivers to work with an elderly person and get them to to be thinking of those things, especially employment standards issues. Not Some elderly persons are not as familiar with um, how employment standards has uh, developed in recent years. Um, the other issue is naming the, per as I mentioned, naming the person on the work permit is kind of huge because if the elderly person passes away, and they're the ones named on the work permit. Now the caregiver has to get a new work permit for the next person. And particularly if, if it's an elderly couple that she's caring for, put both names on the work permit. Because if one of the couples passes away, at least she can continue to work for the other employer. Um, and she's not going to be jobless. It takes about four months to get another work permit. So she is unemployed and homeless for four months. So um, it's a real, and the person who, I mean, the, other, the spouse, the surviving spouse who needs the care um, is, uh, is the one being penalized. Um, perhaps the need for, uh, for a son or daughter to have power of attorney to discuss that with the employer. Many caregivers are not even thinking of those things. It only arises when things turn... Um, when the person's health takes a turn. Um, and we do have some, uh, well, I, wandering's kind of funny, but we do, we do have some caregivers who have reported, you know, it's demanding work. It's, some people, they have wandered off and it's kind of, it's, uh, it's uh, scary. And um, we've had caregivers come in who have been abused by the person that they're, be, that they're trying to care for and that the the person's been violent towards them, and they're not sure what to do. So, so I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, so um, the, the, this is the number one issue that we're dealing with is the live-in requirement. We're advocating for caregivers to be able to um, come into Canada and work on a live-out basis. Um, when caregivers are working in the person's home, they're vulnerable to exploitation. Uh, they're vulnerable to, um, the, the, it's just, there's no separation between work life and, and home life. The family separation that caregivers are dealing with is huge. Um, they have, often been separated from their, by the time they apply for permanent residence, many of them have been separated from their families for five or six years. Um, the living care, you can only come into the living caregiver program if you have two years education um, or one year um, train or ex experience working as a living caregiver. So many caregivers, what they do is they, the, the the normal path is leave the Philippines, go to Hong Kong, work for a year or Taiwan or wherever, and then come to Canada, and then it starts beginning. So they've already been separated for at least a year or two elsewhere working abroad before they're coming to Canada. Um, the other issue is that it's not nice to think about, but um, caregivers sometimes they they're dealing with these personal issues uh, regarding the inadmissibility of their family members. Um, if if um, when you're applying for permanent residence, if if the 
if your family abroad, if one of them fails on an immigration test, meaning uh, they're medically or they're criminally inadmissible, then <clears throat> the entire application will fail. So many caregivers are grappling with, um, do I divorce my husband because he has stage five kidney failure? Do I, you know, and they're, and they're, they're isolated while they're, while they're trying to make these decisions. Um, um, we recently just attended a conference that was held last weekend on um, migrant workers that was put on by the Canadian Labour Congress and um, just talking about the temporary status is, um, is huge when you come into Canada and you're, and you're not uh, stable, you're always at the mercy of your employer and they're trying to do the best work that they can but it, it puts them in a very um, vulnerable place. I talked about the backlog and, uh, and the wait times, which is huge. It's, it's, it's odd to think about, but there, there can be huge gaps in employment. And even though the, the demand for the work is there, the caregiver can't actually do that work because they're waiting on getting status in Canada to be able to do the work. I mean, even though we know that we need this service, um, the, the government seems to uh, feel that, I, I almost anticipate a sunset coming in on the Living Caregiver Program because lately the numbers seem to be down and there seems to be a trend to bring people in through other temporary worker programs. Um, I don't know if anybody's been watching the news, but there's a, a trend in having people come into Canada and not giving them the right to permanent residence. So that's a big concern. Um, oh, just going back. Oops. Okay. So on this, there's a, um, there's two, the blue chart here is the um, federal skilled workers. And this is their, their, per, their wait times for permanent residence. So that's decreasing. Well, the red, um, the red bar is other classes of, immigra of other immigration streams, including living caregivers. And the wait times in the backlog is just increasing and increasing. And uh, who is suffering but the living caregivers and the persons that they want to care for. And then I just want to close on a, just a brief discussion about the minimum wage. Um, I made a point of asking um, Ms. McKenzie about uh, community workers, health workers, and, and what they're compensated. And uh, she advised me that um, it's approximately $20 an hour. Well, live-in caregivers, for the most part, are paid minimum wage, which has just increased to 10.25 but they're working round the clock. <laughs> they're not working eight hours, they're working, you know, 14 hours. And they're not always paid adequately for that. There's many times caregivers come in and are you paid overtime? No, but I'm getting other things. Like what? A job. <laughs> um, there's a push uh, right now for employers to, um, lower the amount, or raise the amount that they can charge for a room and board. Oh, okay, I'm told that we just have one more minute. So um, it's something to think about, and um, it, it's, it's, it, it is, we talked about compensation and how to fairly compensate, and, um, and also um, from our organization's perspective, I mean, I, we're a nonprofit, doing the best that we can to provide legal aid to um, these caregivers who need assistance to get the work permits to do the work and all the host of problems that come with it and to get them the permanent residence in Canada so they can continue to stay in Canada and care for that employer that they've built that relationship and stayed with them for the last two years. So um, 
Anyways, that's all I want to say about that. Thanks. <laughs>